Hi everybody, this is International Master David Proust, and today we'll be looking at my favorite game from the fourth round of the Candidates Tournament to determine a challenger for World Champion Magnus Carlsen this year. Um, round four had uh, three games that were interesting to me, so I had a good choice of games, and I was not sure at first which game to even look at. There's a very interesting draw between Anand and Kramnik with some very flashy moves in it and, a f and some cool ideas. Um, and then there's a win by Aronian over Svidler in a complicated Grunfeld game, uh, which I thought was a little bit rough. Um, so instead, I'm going to show you uh, a more run-of-the-mill game, a more ordinary-looking game than those two games, but a game which to me is like a very interesting struggle and a kind of game that comes up pretty often. So uh, we're going to be seeing a game between Mamed Yarov as white and Andraken as black. And Mamed Yarov started off the tournament with uh, two really pathetic losses in his first three games. I mean, he lost his queen to a fairly simple queen trap round move 13 against Aronian. And then and that was as black, and then as white, he played a really limp game against Anand and lost with white in round three. Um, so it was looking like he really just didn't have his form with him at this tournament and might sort of develop into a little Ivanchuk kind of situation, like when Ivanchuk sort of messed up the candidates tournament last year by just sitting there and flagging against some people and playing great against other people and kind of really mixing up the tournament in a weird way, so it's hard to tell who really deserves to win the tournament. Anyway, Mamed Yarov said in an interview that he was hoping that he could turn around his form and he didn't know why it was bad, and uh, he showed up for round four and seemed to successfully put it behind him. So let's check out this very cool game. As I said, he is white here. And we start with a Queen's Gambit Slav declined. Sorry about those arrows. Should go like this. Um, so the pawn on d5 is simply supported by the c6 pawn. If white trades, he doesn't gain anything in the center. But now black plays the a6 variation. And this is a somewhat new approach to the Queen's Gambit. I mean, if you follow opening theory or top level tournaments, you'll have seen it by now, and you know, you can. I think you're so much cooler than me by uh, saying, like, that's not new at all. I've seen it in this game and that game. Um, but for those of you who haven't seen this move, you'll appreciate that I stop for a second and consider it. It's a little bit odd when you consider that uh, in this position, alternate moves would be to try and develop this bishop by moving one of these two pawns um, to develop him. Um, this move is also happens to be in the center. Um, so, it, it, under those circumstances, it seems a little bit odd to move the side pawn. Um, but there are a lot of, of uh, Queen's Gambit declined and accepted positions also where this a6 move proves useful. Um, often it's used in order to play b5. Sometimes you take on c4, then when they recapture, then you play b5 and uh, gain space on the queen side, and then follow up with c5 as well. Um, so that's one use of a6. Another use is to take on c4 in some position where your opponent doesn't have time to recapture right away, and then play b5 to defend your extra pawn, supported by a6 and c6 pawns. Um, there are also situations where you just play b5 to force white to do something with this pawn, um, because if he just trades it, then you'll get a symmetrical position, which you kind of want. Um, to exploit this move is not very easy, even though it seems like a slightly weird side move. But in general, if you wanted to take advantage of it as white, you would you would tend to want to play a move c5, taking advantage of the slight weakening of b6, uh, or not not even slight, the weakening of b6, which makes it so that when you play c5, if they play b6 to challenge your space, and you take, they can't take back with the a pawn and strengthen their center. Um, and if they don't fight back at all on the queen side, this move here has weakened 
things a little bit, which gives you some more ways to advance on the queen side. For example, if you play b5, sorry, if you play b5 with a pawn on a4, you're possibly going to force more trades or have more trading options yourself. Or you could maneuver piece to b6 at some point. So in general, I think a lot of the, the variations that are most testing against the a6 queen's gambits are c5 variations. But in this game, white continues with normal knight f3 first, e6. <clears throat> and now this would be you know, the semi-slob if the knight were on d7 instead of a6. Um, but white plays the move a3 here, which is not a super obvious way of punishing the move a6 by black. Um, it controls bishop to b4, which allows white to play a variation that isn't played very often against uh, the semi slot So we'll see it in a second. So knight. So imagine that this position here would be mainline theory if these pawns were on a7 and a2. And just bear with me as I as I get to this position, queen c2. So the queen c2 variation, there's a lot of variations that are played with it now involving bishop e2, bishop d3, g4, bishop d2. There's a whole bunch of different variations with it, but one of the most obvious reasons for this move is to play e4 next move. And one of the reasons that that line is not very popular is because black can give an annoying check on b4 after trading knights on e4 and force white to trade more pieces headed towards a more even position. But now after queen c7, mom and Yarov played e4. And, sorry, going too fast. And after these trades here, black doesn't have uh, the annoying possibility of trading on e4. Trading on e4 followed by giving check. So white is not forced to trade one extra piece. And uh, for the moment, that makes this move slightly useful, whereas the use of this move is not yet apparent in this variation. So white's able to play this move e4. And what's desirable about this move if black doesn't have this thing is that basically it increases the pressure on d5, possibly threatens e5, to the point where it gets black to trade off the pawn on d5. And if you look at this situation here, white has two pieces, which are trying to put pressure on d5. But black has defended it in order to try and keep his central outpost. That shows that both players value this pawn on d5 is being very important for controlling the game. After white forces that trade by increasing the pressure, in the resulting position, white's pawns in the center are obviously giving him more space than black's pawns in the center, which is also an explanation for those who didn't understand why black would want to trade pieces. It's because... Um, he has less space than white, so trading relieves his cramp and gives him room for the pieces he has left afterwards. So black strikes back against white center right away here with the move c5. Um, and that's going to trade off this pawn and really minimize white's central advantage. So we still get a pretty uh, acceptable looking position for black here after a move or two. Pawn takes c5. Now here black plays the move a5. And the reason for this is that he doesn't want to allow white to expand on the queen side with the move b4. And now this bishop doesn't have very good squares. White is happy to even play c5 to harass the bishop further. So let's imagine the bishop probably goes back to e7. Now after bishop b2, this bishop finds a nice diagonal. And white has gained space on the queen side, which could have some value for him here. Um, and with tempo, this bishop finds a very, very nice diagonal. Um, prevents black from playing e5 to free this bishop. Um, and in some cases, you know, white could put some pressure on the black king side with two bishops pointed at it. So um, in the game, Andreykin takes time out to play a5 before taking on c5. And this move is aimed to prevent b4 because black could take and white can't capture with his a3 pawn because of the rook lineup. So um, Mamed Yarov just develops simply here and finds a long open diagonal for this guy. 
none of the arrows or anything are working. I, I, ap <laughs> I apologize. I don't know what has been up with this board. It was really buggy yesterday, too. Um, but anyway, he's found a good diagonal for his bishop. And they castle on the king's side, where they each have pawn cover. And now we have a very classic and important pawn structure for uh, all of chess, which is a queenside majority for one player, three versus two, and since pawns are equal, it means the other player has the pawn majority on the other side. But here it is a four versus three. And the fact that these pawn majorities are of different sizes, even though the difference is still of one, um, actually leads to more interesting play than if these two pawns were missing and it was 3 versus 2 and 3 versus 2 would be sort of a kind of opposite symmetry. But here there's some difference. Um, and uh, let's, um, let's try and get at that a little bit. Uh, if you already think you know everything about this pawn structure you can skip ahead a minute or two. Um, Alright, so Generally speaking, having an extra pawn on some particular side of the board or in some particular area, would that make you stronger or weaker in that area? What do you think? The answer is it tends to make you stronger in that area. So white having a pawn majority on the queen side, we would tend to expect white to have some kind of advantage on the queen side. Um, of course, a pawn is not a very powerful fighting unit, but it is still something, right? It still controls a couple squares, and that small amount can be enough to give you, you know, a noticeable advantage if the two players decide to fight in the area where you have an extra pawn. So similarly, black would be expected to be a little bit stronger, at least in this area here, and possibly, you know, extending a little bit over to the king side over here, depending on how this pawn influences white's ability to control that side of the board. Um, now, pawn majorities are not always advantages. There are things called minority attacks, and it is possible when you have a pawn majority, if your pawns end up being a little bit weak, for your opponent to actually put pressure on them. And uh, you can reach a situation where you're sorry that you have this extra pawn, um, in that area, or basically your opponent's plan is really to put to put pressure on, on your extra pawn there, and then eventually win on the other side where he has an extra pawn once he's uh, maybe one one your weak pawn where you had the advantage. But by and large, the extra pawn will provide an advantage for you. So white's typically going to look for some kind of play on the queen side. And that can partly explain the positioning of his bishop that he chose as well. He spent a whole move with g3 to develop his bishop on g2. When he could, in one move, have placed it on d3, right? It would have saved a move, but it would have aimed at the king side. And this positioning of the bishop tells us that white is partly thinking that he may want to play on the queen side, certainly aiming the bishop that way, right? And that's where he's got his extra pawn. So he may be able to put a little bit of pressure against this pawn here or this whole area of the board around that pawn. Now, um, one of the key and most obvious things that you do in these kind of major um, opposite pawn majority positions is you do a majority attack, which starts by advancing or activating as we sometimes say, activating your pawn majority. So you're all used to activating pieces probably, like the idea that if I put my rook on d1, it's more active than on f1 because it can move a lot and controls a lot of squares. Well, you don't think of pawns as being able to move a lot or control a lot of squares. Nevertheless, the move black plays here, e5, is uh, considered activating his pawn majority. He's preventing bishop f4, so he's controlling some more squares. He's gaining space. He's letting this bishop get out. He's letting this bishop get out into this area over here. Um, 
and gaining space there. So that is uh, the typical, most typical plan to use in this kind of position with these opposite side majorities. Another thing that can be very important in these positions before we go on is the mutually open file. Um, there's one file that both players have open on which the rooks can oppose each other and if one player can get full control of that file that can be very valuable both in a middle game or in an end game with these kind of uh, majorities. So I'll just throw that out there as an important theme. It doesn't really come up much in this game but it's, uh, it's a typically important theme in these positions. So black activates his majority, classic, and now white plays a very interesting move with bishop g5. As I said, I mean, it's very common to put the bishop on the long diagonal in positions where there have been some trades. But I think uh, there's an, a couple reasons why white doesn't do that. One reason is black's already successfully played e5, and black is a little bit stronger in this area. So by now, white can probably see that black can defend his e5 pawn possibly against the bishop on b2 and uh, actually block it in there. Uh, another reason is that in general, white's now put this bishop aiming at the queen side, so he's not really looking so much at a king side attack at the moment. Um, but also, what's really nice about this move is that the knight on f6 doesn't actually have a much better square to go to at the moment, and it's kind of awkward for black to try and defend this knight. And if black can't defend the knight, then white would happily... Sorry again, these arrows are impossible. Black would ha white would happily trade on f6 and hurt the pawn structure around black's king. That would really hamper black's ability to use that pawn majority because it would be much easier to blockade it. It would lose mobility. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be easy for white to attack black's king because black still has you know, a fair number of total pawns in front of his king. But it would it would certainly be bad for his ability to use this pawn majority actively. So Andraken comes up with a fairly awkward way of defending against the doubling of his pawns. But let's imagine he tries to do something else. Um, knight to d7 blocks this bishop in. So long term, he's not going to be very happy about doing that. And there's a number of things that white can do, but I think that if black's going to slow down his development, just developing a rook and trying to start controlling this open file when your bishop's... Whoa. Sorry. When your bishop is also controlling the square on which black could try to challenge it, I think that's a very promising way to start from here and I think if you looked at a bunch of moves down the road, you would see that it's not really good for black to slow down his own development like this. Um, so another possibility, so as not to block in this bishop, would be to play knight to g4. Then I think white can just play h3. And if the knight retreats, it only has these two squares where you can double his pawns. If he takes on f2, um, I think white will come out ahead uh, and that trade of knight and bishop for rook and pawn is usually not very good in the middle game so start to see that this knight doesn't have a lot of really good squares play this move um, as another option perhaps um, and here I think black's basically going to be playing f6 in a moment. Um, and this is the what looks like the most viable of his alternatives because he actually has a plan for you know continuing to develop f6, knight d6. He can sort of get all his pieces out. So this is an alternative that could be considered to the move played in the game, which was rook a6 covering the knight. But of course, knight e8 doesn't look great to me either. Uh, I respect it as an alternative because this move doesn't look great, 
Um, but each move has its downsides. Obviously, knight e8, retreating to the back rank and blocking in the rook in order to later bring the knight back out is not the fastest way to develop your game either. So, here, Mohamed Yarov plays an interesting move, bringing this rook to e1, which means he's not fighting for the d-file. And that's a very, very important thing to notice right there, um, that he's not immediately going to fight for the d-file. I think the thing is, that if he plays this move, then against a move like knight to g4, he has to spend a move defending this threat on f2. And he doesn't even have the most convenient ways to do that. So um, he plays something like this. Black also has time for h6, forcing the bishop back. And now his knight could always go to f6 at some point if it wants to. Um, So, you know, or he can do things like this, f5, h3, go for some kind of complicated variations like this. Um, and you can see he has queen g3 coming and rook to g6. So I think those knight g4 variations are annoying enough that Mohamed Yarov brings the A rook over. Um, it's also going to allow him to do the move B4 at some point without trading the awkward rook on A6, as you'll see in a moment. So he attacks the pawn on E5. And, oh yeah, I wanted to mention that, you know, a normal question would be, why doesn't he play E4? And the answer would be that after white plays knight d2, the pawn is suddenly attacked four times. Defended once by a piece that white can trade off. So the pawn's just gone. So that's why he doesn't play e4 here. Um, after rook e8, queen c3, he again doesn't play e4. And I think even with the queen having moved, after knight d2, this pawn is just in really bad trouble. Um, since you can still trade on f6 and then take on e4. So all this pressure on e5, uh, black doesn't really have a great way to, or black has less and less good ways of, of defending that pawn. And he now plays h6, willingly going in for this pawn structure here. So that's a dramatic change. So we have to consider that this would be his other opportunity to play knight to d7 and defend the pawn without taking on those pawn weaknesses. Um, I didn't see any direct refutation to this kind of retreat. Um, there's a number of things that white could do. Uh, he could play b4, like in the game, gaining some space over here. He could also um, look to move this knight. So this bishop could even retreat here um, with the idea of playing knight to g5. Or he can play knight d2 immediately with the idea of bishop d5 and knight e4. Oops, sorry. Knight, <laughs> knight e4. Um, but uh, definitely this knight's going to have to move at some point to let this bishop into the game. So white is in uh, possession of a nice, a, a nice advantage in uh, development here. Um, I still think that f6 might end up being forced by black if white plays this kind of a plan, just continuing to attack e5 a bunch of times. Um, so you'd see something like, sorry, here, 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 so preventing white's bishop d5, but, oh, sorry. This move order may be, maybe it's an improvement to, to play this first. The one thing is, 
Yeah, this way you can go knight c5, I guess. Well, there's a whole bunch of things that could happen. It's hard to properly analyze this in, in detail because there are a hundred possibilities. But I did want to show the idea of attacking h7 to create a further weakness around black's king. Uh, if not, you know, without b4, you can you can also achieve that by allowing a knight trade. Um, when I played bishop d4, it's conceivable that white could possibly go for a queen sack, and that's a whole other complicated thing that one could look at. There's... oh, sorry. Rook takes queen, yeah. That's not possible. Um, there's a whole lot of possible stuff that could happen, but I think... I think it's possible to play this way for black. Like, I didn't see any way, starting from here, that white could really crush black. I think black will play f6, but I think that his position is strong enough, certainly on the side of the board where he's got the pawn majority to support that. And so, I don't even think rookie 2... Rookie 2 I hadn't even analyzed before. I just mentioned it here as a, as a passing variation, but... Because I don't even think white wants to try and force black to play f6, because I think black's going to play it anyway. And the knight can also untangle to f8, possibly, to stay on the king side and defend this weakness. But uh, it seems to me that there's no obvious way for white to crush black, even though black's development is lagging. All right, so in the game, h6, trade, trade, whoops, trade, trade. Sorry, you can't input moves or draw arrows on the board anymore for some reason. Um, and now, more activation of pawn majorities. B4. Um, so, of course, black's going to trade once. Ooh, it let me do it. Oh, but it's because I was wrong. He played bishop f8 first. Huh. That's interesting, given that he definitely wants to trade on b4. I remember the game as having going... Pawn takes b4, pawn takes b4, bishop f8. But apparently it went bishop f8, and only after knight h4 he trades. Um, so any white, anyway, white has activated the pawn majority, and now you see they're controlling four squares like this on the queen side, very strong. Um, if white could bring this knight to some square like this, he'd probably get a lot of queenside pressure. Um, but he doesn't have a quick, easy way to maneuver it. And you see he played b4 before maneuvering the knight so that there wouldn't be this bishop d4 possibility for black. Um, that's why right after b4 he can then move the knight. So white goes to control some of the weak squares uh, in black's structure here in order to keep black's majority under control. And so now black trades. Completes development. And he's going to try and attack these pawns a little bit here, um, rather than sort of suffering for a while. If black doesn't do something to try and provoke some kind of weakness within these pawns, or to try and transition the position dynamically, then white's pawn structure currently is giving him an advantage over here, and black's pawn structure is not currently able to really advance his position very well on the king side. Um, even if he managed to play f5 and technically wasn't losing either of these pawns because they're defended, um, it would still... It, it, it's still going to be hard for him to really threaten good e4 or f4 follow-ups. Um, one possibility is that white would just take over this nice diagonal right away with his bishop if black ever takes, you can take. Pawn on f5 can only be defended by taking this way, but then you lose this pawn. So, well, maybe technically you don't even lose it, but if rook takes e5, bishop g7, and if queen e5, queen c4, or bishop takes b4. So maybe black even could challenge with bishop e6 if white played bishop d5 here. The other like really annoying thing that sometimes happens when you play f5 
is that your opponent plays this move and goes after the f5 square. And if you play f4 and you're like, oh yeah, I didn't lose the pawn on f5 because I moved it, that's not helping you at all because what's happening is white's trading these bishops, leaving black really weak on these e4 and f5 squares. Um, and this pawn majority is still really weak. So this pawn move f4 does not mean that white didn't win the pawn on f5. It means that white did win the fight for the square f5, which is you know, what he's fighting for just as much as to, like, capture this pawn. White's well, not really planning to win this pawn here, but, um, yeah. But anyway, this, this, this move is often really annoying if you try and play f5 when you don't have enough power to back it up by defending it with pieces. So, um, so what black does, okay, they develop the piece. This is very natural. And white plays c5 because his c4 pawn was attacked, and he's gaining more space on... The queen side now. Now, if given time, I imagine that white would slowly increase his advantage on the queen side. Um, possibly play rook a1, trade a rook, try and get control of the a file, maybe trade two rooks. If black ever gives him control of the a file, rook a7 becomes a threat. At the moment, white might be threatening the move queen f3, depending on what black's next move would be here because it would have a double attack on these two weak pawns. And in general, the idea of attacking this pawn is a very appealing idea for white. And queen f3 is appealing because it improves the position of the queen. The queen was placed here in order to pressure e5, but e5 is solidly defended now. If you go to f3, you're in touch with this square and this square, which are two squares that you would like to really control and put pressure on. So, And the queen's on a nice long diagonal, and it's just a much better square for her. So all this to say black goes for immediate action here because his long-term prospects, if he played moves like you know king h8, rook d8, his prospects aren't great with just simple normal moves. Um, you know, bishop g7 to defend this pawn better or something. Just letting white play rook to a1 or rook to d1. <laughs> queen to f3, etc. So, black's move is b6. And uh, he's threatening to just win this pawn, so white advances it, and now white has a very powerful passed pawn. Um, so this this is a move which you might not consider, just because it seems self-destructive to your own queen side to let white play this move. Um, and, you know, white can even fall with b5. But black has sort of looked at this concretely and found a way to try and get some counterplay. Uh, which is exactly what he needed in this game. So it was a really good decision for him. So the move b5, um, which was not played by Mamed Yarov, leads to a bunch of interesting variations. Um, black can follow up with either the tactic bishop b4 or bishop c4. Um, and I've looked at, at both a little bit. So, for example, bishop b4, queen e3, bishop e1, rook e1, king g7. And, uh, you know, white has some compensation for the exchange because he's got this amazing pawn on c6 and a weak king. But he's not yet, you know, winning by any, by any measure. Black still has things mostly controlled and his pieces are, you know, in the game. But perhaps even more than bishop b4, black might want to play bishop c4 in order to win the pawn on b5 more than the rook on f1. Um, but then there's some weird variations that are possible on bishop f1, rook a4, bishop takes b5, rook g4 check, king h8. And we get this weird position. And white definitely has compensation for the pawn he sacrificed again, because this one's really strong, because the king is weak, because this bishop ends up on sort of a weird square here. Um... But again, I wasn't completely sure if uh, if white was was winning or not, since black, uh, you know, at least has the opportunity to undermine this and attack it more. For example, with the move rook e6, um, and black's up a pawn, so there are various ways he could sacrifice a little bit of material to to deal with the pressure that's on him. Um, 
So one of these possibilities of bishop c4 or bishop b4 uh, was sufficient to keep white from playing b5 here, and instead he just plays rook to b1 and covers the b4 pawn. Okay, but again, he's defended this pawn for the moment. What's black going to do now against white's possibilities of you know, consolidating and using this strong pawn? Um, you know, white white could get in position to play b5 as as early as next move possibly, or he could develop this rook first, which would also make sense. Um, so black finally goes for the open file, develops the rook, and uh, his idea is to just activate all the pieces that he can and aim for some counterplay. And we get sort of a wild tactical fight from this, this approach by black. So white improves the queen a little bit, says hello to the pawn on f6, and rook to d4 is played, so black just shows that he's willing to give up this pawn. And again, it would be a trade with the idea that black is managing to activate his pieces a little bit better. Now the bishop on g7 doesn't look as silly without a pawn on f6, and white can take back on b4 the pawn that he sacrificed on f6, and the game goes on. Although white's position, I think, remains a little bit better, uh, it also remains better in the game without taking on f6. So, rook d4, um, whoops, sorry, now it's playing that move, but Mamed Yarov just brings his knight to f5, which is a strong square. Now, black is going to leave this strong knight on the square for a long time, and I'm just going to give you one example of why it can be bad to trade into this opposite colored position. And the reason is the black king is suddenly devastatingly weak to the threat of bishop e4 and white coming in along the light squares to make life hard for him. I mean, he simply can't stop this move. Even if he takes on b4 in order to control e4 with his rooks, white can just trade a rook and then play bishop e4. So essentially, black has to be prepared to play bishop g7 and allow his king to wander. And um, then white's going to try and develop the rook and take advantage of this situation. Um, for example, go for rook a1, trying to play rook a8 along with queen h7, which would lead to a checkmate. The move rook d1 is not as crushing because black can play rook d4, although white's position remains good. I mean, possibly even just instantly winning with something like this. Right? So... Uh, once once white gets this, there's this huge activity difference between his bishop and black's bishop and the safety of the black king and the safety of the white king. So these opposite colored bishop positions that white offers black repeatedly here, um, they depend very heavily on activity and king safety because the attacking side can attack certain squares with the bishop that the defending side can't defend with their bishop. So whoever's attacking will sometimes feel like they almost have an extra piece in their attack compared to the defender. So very, um, you very much have to consider what the resulting activity will be of the bishops if you're trading into an opposite colored bishop position, and also who will have the initiative or who will be attacking. So um, black just takes the pawn on d4 without trading off that knight. White trades a pair of rooks because together these rooks were being annoying, controlling all these squares, and then follows up with queen h5 with a threat of taking the pawn on h6. It's not like the most crushing threat because black is up a pawn at the moment, and you know he could survive losing that pawn without getting checkmated as long as he keeps this good bishop to help him defend. But uh, still, it makes sense to defend the pawn, I think, and so he defends it. And now we again see a little bit of the theme of bringing the rook to the open file. And here, actually, after I thought about this for a bit, um, well, 
not that long, but after I looked at this position, I realized the white move rook d1 carries with it a pretty immediate threat. So in this position here, black initiated continuing tactics with queen c8 threatening the knight on f5. But I was sort of asking myself, well, why did black have to do anything, right? Is there anything preventing him from just playing rook to b2 or b5 even, right? Does white even have anything going? Well, the answer is yes. White has a pretty crushing threat here, and that threat is to play rook to d7. So um, I'll just play a random move just to show it to you. Let's see, did I put this in before? No. All right, so let's get to this position. So first of all, if the bishop takes the rook, you can check here, check here, and mate. You can imagine that that checkmate is exactly the same if black throws in rook b1, check bishop f1. He still gets checkmated exactly the same by the queen and knight if he takes it. If he instead backs off with his queen, let's say here, for example, white can still take on f7 with check, and there's no, um, no great defense here for black. Um, if king here, then queen g6 leads to mate. If bishop takes, then queen takes. Well, I, can, I guess I can show some moves here on this one. Um, he can get to this position here, where he's got the rook against the knight. Um, white can take another pawn. And repeat this. And now there's more than one thing that white can do, but I think... Wait, let me think one second. It's not king g2 here because of queen c6. And I don't think it's c7 because of rook c1. Huh. What does white do here? It's almost tugzwang for both players. I guess if black could play, their next move would be rook c1, trying to deal with this pawn. Hmm. Let's see. Maybe white can just allow queen takes here with check. King g2, and then if check, you come here. So the threat is queen takes f8 to checkmate your opponent. And basically, the idea is that if he defends that, then you play here, threatening checkmate. And if he moves this piece to defend that, you can always checkmate on g7. So actually, it might be that king g2, just developing this bishop, is the way to win this position here. Interesting. Random variations, not that many people will care. Threat and checkmate. He takes it, you take it. And then if he tries to take the knight that's hanging. Oh. C7, the queen can come back. And black survives that. So rook c1. Maybe you would play the very slow bishop b5 defending the pawn and just leaving black in this horrible mess. Also, now that your bishop is unpinned, you can go for queen d7 um, and go into, go into the end game with the c pawn and then rook d1, your pawn's defended. <laughs> Let's go back to 
what's actually done. So after rook d1, this move rook d7 is a very serious threat. And black plays the move queen c8 here. So he's disrupting the knight on f5. White would love to just control the light squares with bishop e4, but he doesn't have that square. But, you know, if you could do that, that is ideally what you would do as white in a position like this. You would love to just put your bishop here, control every light square if possible. But no go this time. Um, I didn't consider the move g4 when I was looking through this game before. Um, and I'd say it looks, it actually looks conceivable. I mean, you could technically play this. If black takes, you can take here with check. Chip g7, take here. Threatening queen g6. And if queen here. I don't know. Something or other happens. It seems like possible that this is playable for white. Black doesn't have to trade the knight either. Um, but if you want to keep control of f5, which you really do, this move actually suggests itself as a candidate move that you have to consider. Um, but the other candidate move that I wanted to consider was after queen c8, I thought, well, what if white plays rook d7 anyway, once I'd realized that this was sort of a big idea for white. Um, so... Again, if black takes on d7, I think this was basically losing for him. All these trades, and then this brutal move here, just threatening checkmate. Um, when pawn takes bishop, already looked pretty good. Um, and I think this was the end, winning for white. So black still can't take the rook, but I found a a defense for black. Whoops. It's not going to... All right, I have to find the moves and the variations here. Check here, and now king to g8. So this move really stops rook f7. The crazy thing is, I think that queen e8 is another move I looked at, trying to defend this on an f7, although the computer now seems to think it's illegal. Anyway, you're going to have to... Uh, just imagine this move for a second. This move turns out not to successfully defend f7 because of the tactic rook e7. Chasing the queen off of f7 because bishop takes rook leads to check and mate. Um, it's too bad that I can't even make moves on this board right now, but think of it as an opportunity for you to practice your calculation and visualization. So you can imagine that variation of queen e8, rook e7, bishop e7, queen h6 check, and mate follows. But so anyway, so black can actually defend this variation with king to g8, defending f7 sufficient times, and here I couldn't quite find a win for white, though I looked at a variety of things. King h7 was losing to queen e4, so you gotta be careful. King h8, I looked at a few moves, for example, queen h4, threatening this, uh, but now black finally can take on d7. And here there's no particularly crushing follow-up from white. Um, he has to trade off his important pass pawn in order to get back this bishop. Then he's still down in exchange. He doesn't have the strong pass pawn. Black still has f7 covering some squares around his king. It's just not good for white. So he can't play rook d7 after queen c8. g4 is an interesting alternative, but knight e3 is played in the game. And we have this very, very classic fighting for these light squares, like four and against this passed pawn, four and against this king position, black's up a pawn this whole time, and we constantly have to ask ourselves, what would happen if black, you know, decided to activate and develop this piece and just come after white to try and control the light squares by getting this dark square bishop to trade for this knight, or if not, to get counterplay against f2. Well, in this case, white has a strong move, knight d5 is the answer here. 
It threatens knight takes rook. It also threatens knight f6 check. Um, so for example, if you just play here, white can take here with check, king here, and then the move. Honestly, I even now that I'm here, I'm thinking like, can I play queen e5 instead of knight e4? I mean, knight e4 is a very solid looking move. But you know what? I am feeling like I could just sack this pawn and play queen e5, and it would work even better than knight e4, I think. The point is that either way, white has won back the pawn that they've sacked, and they maintain a better position. This pawn is really dangerous, this past pawn. Black doesn't have anything comparable, and black's king is going to be weaker than white's king with these split pawns. So, in this exact position, knight d5 is the reason why black doesn't bring out this bishop now. But we should always consider, you know, black's attempts at getting active and, and stopping defending these pawns. Because, uh, I mean, this is how Andrekin has been trying to play the position. He's really trying, been trying to find some counterplay, some specific threats and ways to, to bust out with his pieces. So, whoops, so... Yeah, so he plays something kind of like this insofar as he plays f5, a very active move, um, seeking to control, thinking that he's got this square sufficiently controlled now. Um, he gains more space, which and it improves this bishop potentially. So um, the move that we talked about before against a move like f5 was bishop h3. Um, and... It could look something like f4, knight f5, and white gets control of the square once again. Um, the question is whether or not that's good enough uh, at this point against this move here. Taking his very valuable passed pawn, if you go for a checkmating attack, white can wind up um, getting checkmated himself even faster than black. The situation here is grim. Like bishop f1, bishop c4, something like that. White doesn't have time to take this and this. So, you know, if black has time to collect this pawn here, the fact that you've gained control of the f5 square, while very nice, is not going to allow you to win when you're down two pawns, right? I mean, white White doesn't have, you know, getting control of a square is a positional goal. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have force made or that you can sacrifice multiple pawns for it. Uh, so he doesn't go for bishop h3, but he does go for a move aimed at um, controlling the light squares. With bishop d5. Um... So with this move, he may also slightly be thinking of playing knight takes f5 as a sack. Oh yeah, I forgot to show this to you, that knight f5 here is a move worth considering. Wow, I really can't enter a single move. So it's a sacrifice. The idea is to get into f7, right? Like the rook d7 sacrifices. But in this case, we don't have a knight on f5 anymore. So black can actually play bishop g7 for the first time. And now, actually, his bishops are pretty well coordinated <laughs> and covering the king just, just fine. So this is not very plausible just yet. Um, but having the bishop on d5, one idea behind this might be to play knight f5, but the real threat, I think, was bishop takes e6 here, probably. Um, so, I don't know if there's any neutral move I can play for black to illustrate this point. Let's try. Wow, let me make a move. Okay, takes. So, if the queen takes, white can take on f5. And if the pawn takes, white can get into f7. And do stuff like this. And this is really brutal if white can get this active. So that's kind of the, the main threat after bishop d5 is trading off this bishop and then breaking into one of those two squares that are defended by it. Um, black plays f4. 
uh, sort of pressing the issue by attacking the knight. And um, what what white plays in the game is uh, knight c2. But let's just look at one alternative here for a moment. Taking on e6, it attacks the queen and threatens queen f7 check. So there's not much time for black to do anything other than defend this. Now white gets the f5 square that we talked about. So knight f5, get to this position. And if queen takes here, queen f7 is winning. So at the moment, the pressure from this is strong enough to keep black from just collecting this pawn. Very, very important. Um, so, rook to c4 is probably the key move in this position. And this is similar to a position that we just looked at moments ago with bishops on the board for each side. One of the differences of having the bishops traded is that the queen actually defends this pawn now instead of being blocked by the bishop. If white goes for rook d8, this bishop can actually move because queen h6 isn't checkmate. Although, black has to calculate knight takes h6 as a variation. But I think you'd start like this, this, take this with check, oh no, because now, one second, queen g6 I think. Um, and black comes out with a pretty good position, I think, right? Because he's attacking these pieces, and next move he could save the bishop, because white doesn't have any other threat. Yeah. Seems good. So just try and deal with this pawn in the most effective way possible. It seems like black survives giving up the f5 square. So um, Mamed Yarov went for something more directly tactical. Knight c2. Not letting me play it. Okay. Knight c2. Attacking the rook. And yeah, let's, um, let's stop for a second and, and point out one sort of lesson from all of this, which is that these fights over a couple squares are extremely tactical, right? These are all these little tactical skirmishes determining whether or not, you know, this knight is able to go to f5 or has to retreat to c2, whether or not these pawns live or die. Because here, one of the things that white has got is he's got the attack on e5 from this pawn advancing. Gosh, it's annoying that I can't show anything anymore. The f6 pawn advancing to f4 has left the e5 pawn undefended, so when white plays knight c2, attacking b4, it's uh, kind of a, a double attack as part of this whole skirmish going on. At the same time, black has the possibility of trading the bishop and then trying to snag the c6 pawn in some cases, and this knight is no longer on the scene to make tactical threats against his king. So you get these long, weird tactical variations off in deciding these things. Okay, the rook um, moved away, and yeah, at first I thought the rook had to move there because it was trying to prevent bishop e4 check, but bishop e4 check is not necessarily the end of the world. I think the reason the rook stays on the fourth rank is actually a little bit more intricate than that, as we'll see in, in the variations in the game. But if he played rook b2, white can take on e5, I think, and just not defend the knight because of the fork. So even trading bishops, white comes here, and if he takes on c2, there's queen e4. And uh, meanwhile, white's threatening queen f7 check as well as knight d4. So, yeah, weird situation. Um, so the game move is rook to a4. Uh, white has to grab this pawn that he was 
that was part of his tactical calculations because his knight's been sent far away from the light squares he was trying to control. And black has advanced his majority, and this pawn needs to be defended. So white connects his queen to the center. Black has to activate the bishop in return for that. And this is a move I was just trying out. The game went bishop e4 check. Um, but I think here an interesting alternative from Mamed Yarov was queen h5. And then rook a5. And then bishop e4 check. So now I'm not trading this bishop because I needed to defend this and the structure on the king side has already changed such that I don't I don't have the same kind of possibility of bringing the knight into f5 by trading off his light squared bishop so I don't have the same incentive to trade off his bishop even though you often do want to break up their bishop pair and then get your knight into those squares well right now can't really then king g8, queen f3, takes, takes. Some position like this um, looked to me like a plausible position for them to get. And uh, my evaluation would be that it's a bit in white's favor, although it's a tricky position. Um, white's king is probably not that much more secure than black's at this point, because frankly this bishop is really good here. White's advantage is mainly this c6 pawn basically. Um, but that could be a pretty good advantage because that pawn looks pretty scary and white has regained the pawn that they've sacrificed while keeping this really strong pawn easily defended. Um, and I feel pretty good about white's position here. So I think that was a, a nice alternative for Mamed Yarov to consider. In the game he went for bishop e4 check, king g8, and remember, his queen is still attacked, so the intended follow-up is to grab this pawn. And here, I think, is partly is where we see why Andrekin left his rook on the fourth rank instead of going to you know b3 or b2 or something. Well, b3 was impossible. Instead of going somewhere else, um, was for this follow-up of f5 with a tactical situation if white tried to clean up both of these pawns. Um, he did have time that, you know, at some point he could have played a move like this. Um, and made this kind of a pawn trade if he'd wanted to at some point. It was it was conceivable for black. But uh, he thought that he had a pretty good tactic here with f5. And in fact, I think he does have a decent chance here. And that's why... I was looking at the alternative for white of not playing this check but just being content to play queen h5 and keep the queen on the board, avoid that tactical sequence, and just try and make use of this c6 pawn in this position I mentioned. So, in the game, check here takes f5. All right, so this pawn, uh, bishop, is uh, in trouble to this pawn, thanks to this pin. Oh, look, the arrows are back, so nice. And white, of course, has his idea of what he was going for, which is making use of that passed pawn when black gives him the, the tempo to do it. Again, based on the queen being here to defend c7, a totally new theme, right? Because for a long, long time, white has never threatened c7, right? White never controlled that square. So it's this long series of intricate moves that lead to new possibilities. Rook e4, rook check, king f7. And here's where it seems that Andraken really messed up when he could have instead put his king on a safer square here. Um, so you'll see what happens in the game with his king on this square. Queen d6, queen a6. So these two pieces, for the moment, are keeping c8 covered. And frankly, since white has uh, lost a piece on e4, even if black had to trade his bishop for this pawn, right? Even if here, 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 there weren't the queen, and you were just trading your bishop for that pawn, that might still be playable for black, right? Because it would be equal material. Um, sorry, so queen here. So, okay, so black's got this square covered, but now... 
Um, Mamed Yarov has a nice tactical move here. Rook d7 check. Aimed around, obviously trying to promote this pawn. So if the bishop takes, queen takes, and white's just able to promote and get an extra queen. For example, here. Check. Extra queen. So he doesn't take it. Instead of taking, he has to run with the king. So he moves the king here. But notice that if his king had been on h7, rook d7 wouldn't be check. He wouldn't have to spend a move moving his king. He wouldn't have to move his king into this pin. And now this is a really, really nice move with which Mohamed Yarov is able to win the game. And basically an inconceivable move with the black king over on h7. Um, but this move just aims at pushing this pawn, but keeps the queen on this row to pin the bishop. The other amazing thing about this position is the work this knight is doing. <laughs> Whoa, it worked. So the knight is covering both checks from the rook and the queen that could possibly create a really strong counterplay. I mean, if this knight weren't here, just imagine rook e1, king here, queen here. Sometimes you lose when this happens to you. Sometimes it's a perpetual check, right? Here, seems like you would lose. There might be better than taking this queen, but taking the queen's good. Yeah, made in one. So the knight doing a great job of controlling these pieces, and now the queen finds her magical winning square on c6, controlling c8. Um, the threat is simply to queen and, you know, moving the king back to where it should have been three moves before doesn't actually stop this from queening. And this position here is not an endgame that black has any hope of holding. So the game basically ends after queen c6. Black just can't stop the promotion, really. He played queen c8, I believe. And then rook to d8 attacks the queen. If the queen moves, he can queen, and again, the bishop can't trade for the pawn because of this. So the game ended with this move, this move, and he resigns. After he takes, white takes, and white's not only got a rook against a bishop, but he's got a pawn that black can't deal with. So um, white suddenly wins there. Which uh, shows us that in this position, had the black king gone to h7, sorry, king h7, um, it's not at all obvious how white, you know, would would prosecute this game. I mean, the queen's probably going to move here. This is also possible, but the queen has to move somewhere, and now this queen can move out of the way. And if you look at this, I mean, this bishop is just controlling c8. White has no way to attack the defender, right? Knight d4 is covered by this bishop, as well as this rook, as well as rookie one check, right, which we already know is basically a winning, instantly winning counterplay from black. So white doesn't really seem to have any prospects here for uh, winning the game if the black king had gone to h7. But I feel like white held a little bit of an advantage for most of this game, so to me it makes sense that here white could have kept playing with queen h5 and still maintained that little lead. But um, uh, I hope that you also found really interesting and cool this whole battle between the two players over all these light squares, over the past pawn on the queen side. I think that both players played really dynamically. They like really went for things. They never just they never just accepted a, a, a slow grind to the position because they realized how critical the situation was, and so they were each fighting, forcing the other person to fight more and more. And uh, I think this is a really, really valuable game to, to play over and study. Uh, very interesting. Uh, it was very interesting for me to study it. And uh, I've played a bunch of games, you know, in a similar, with similar fights going on, but at a lower level. And uh, it's great to, to be able to see what it looks like at this level, um, which is largely a lot of little tactical uh, nuances. 
but um, both players playing both sides of the board, regardless of who's technic who's theoretically stronger or weaker there as I introduced the pawn structure, but you know, all kinds of different details coming up. Um, you know, once black's pawn structure became weaker on the king side, white had certain chances to do things on um, on the king side where white technically had one pawn less. But also black, when white was threatening to lock him up with white's pawn structure on the queen side, black also said, you know, I have to fight back against it before white gets all his pieces in position. I have to fight while there's some little squares that white has trouble controlling and black manages to make things really scrappy, brings the second rook in and you know he's just going after these squares for counterplay. So uh, really really cool play on um, seeing the players both playing both sides of the board in this intricate fashion. So um, that's, uh, that's the game. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, uh, there should be uh, some more excellent games coming up soon. So far this tournament has been very, very exciting and interesting. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing to follow it. And uh, if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask in the comment section. If there's um, any games that you want me to look at that I uh, am not looking at, you can uh, leave such suggestions for me. And uh, have a good day.